Hello everybody, in this video we are going to discuss the module one, part one notes. All right, so um, you can just follow along with me in this video and then you can go in and download the notes and uh, look at them on your own after this video. All right, so um, your reading for this week is going to be the Bingeli book. Um, the Bingeli book is the one that's called Building Systems for Interior Designers, the third edition. Um, and you need to read chapters one and two this week. I think it's about 40 pages total. All right. Um, so our topics for this week, we are in the first module, which is introduction to building systems and st sustainability. All right. And then um, we're going to start with chapter one here, environmental conditions and the site. All right. So here we go with an introduction to building systems. So uh, first of all, we need to ask the question, why is it important to, uh, for an interior designer to be familiar with building systems? Interior designers must be familiar with all aspects of how a building functions to do their jobs effectively. Um, they also work in close coordination with architects and engineers who have very technical expertise. Um, and because of that, you have to have this back and forth coordination with them so that means that you also have to be familiar with the functions of these various building systems and the terminology that's associated with them, okay? If you're talking to an architect or an engineer about something really complex like this, let's face it, you don't want to sound like you don't know what you're talking about, all right? You don't want to sound stupid. Um, if you say something incorrectly or if you don't have a good enough understanding of it, um, because they can be really technical people and... Um, you really have to understand this terminology um, in order to communicate with them and be productive on a project team. All right. Um, usually you're going to work in very close coordination with them. So it's super important that you know what you're talking about so that one, you can do your job um, effectively, but also in a more um, maybe realistic sense, you don't embarrass yourself. Okay. Um, so when it comes to building systems, what exactly are we talking about? Well, there's various types of building systems that we have to uh, think about and you can associate a building system to maybe like a system within our body. Okay. So if you think about our body, we have our circulatory system. Okay. Um, we have we have our system for um, eating and um, you know consuming nutrients. All right, we have our uh, respiratory system. We have all these systems inside of our body that um, allow us to function. All right, and live. Um, same thing with a building. All right, so we have structural systems. This is basically like um, like our skeletal system, right? Our bones. It's what keeps our body together. Um, stru the structural system is what holds the building together and keeps the, uh, keeps it from falling apart. Um, and then we have a series of MEP systems. So MEP, that is a term that you will see very often in the industry. That stands for mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. All right. You're going to work with a lot of, um, engineers depending on what your role is and they are going to be an engineer that either focuses on one of these three things. All right. And MEP breaks down into a series of categories. So, um, within like mechanical, we have HVAC. Okay. So this is our heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Um, and then we have sprinklers. Okay. For su fire suppression. We also have alarm systems, that's going to tie into plumbing, sprinklers, or no, sprinklers will tie into plumbing. Alarm systems are going to tie into your electrical systems. Um, plumbing systems, again, plumbing and then just electrical. Okay. Um, interior designers must also be conscious of environmental factors and how they impact the building and interior spaces. Okay, so um, some examples of environmental factors. What I mean by that is you have to be familiar with the site conditions, the climate that you are building in, um, sunlight conditions, energy conditions, and then 
Um, yeah, those are the main things. Um, architects and engineers, they're going to bear most of the responsibility in ensuring a building's design is appropriate based on those environmental factors. Okay, so they're going to be the ones who are studying the site. They're studying the um, sun conditions to make sure that you're making the best use of the natural sunlight. Um, they're studying, you know, wind conditions, all of those things in a lot of detail. Us as interior designers, we're not focused as much on that, but again, we have to have sort of that understanding so that we can relate to the architects and understand what they're talking about because we're gonna be coordinating with them quite a bit and we also may have a say in some of that stuff, okay? Depending on what your role, specific role is, you might have a say in um, the architectural design of the building as well. Um, but interior designers, they have a more specialized focus when it comes to those things. So um, your primary focus as an interior designer will be a focus on selection of sustainable materials that promote energy conservation, all right, which in turn is going to prevent, you know, things like climate change. Um, what do I mean by selecting sustainable materials? Um, some examples here are if you were going to specify some of these things on a project, like um, for example, energy efficient lighting. Okay, so the old fixtures that we always use in the past were incandescent fixtures. And if you're not familiar with those, just think of a regular old light bulb that has the little filament inside of it. That's an example of an incandescent um, fixture. Well, the new technology is LED, which is a lot more sustainable. It's a lot more energy efficient Okay, and it's a lot better for the environment. Um, you might also select things like carpet and upholstery or flooring or wall coverings um, that are made from like recycled materials. Okay, so we're not creating more waste. We are taking um, old things and we're turning them into new things. Um, and that just helps uh, reduce your overall carbon footprint. Okay, so you might want to look into um, those types of products, things that aren't harmful to the earth, but things that are actually reducing waste. Um, and then also maybe specifying plumbing fixtures that can serve on water usage, right? So um, these types of things, focusing on conservation, energy conservation, that's going to be one of your main focuses as an interior designer, as opposed to all those other things that architects and engineers will be um, you know, mainly concerned with. Although you do have to have some base level knowledge of those things. And again, like I said, those things are like the climate, sunlight, energy, all those are really important. Um, but you don't have to know them as in depth as an architect or an engineer would. All right, moving on from that, we're going to dive a little bit into types of energy. Okay. So here we go. Energy sources. Um, energy sources are split into two categories and a lot of this stuff should be um, review from like maybe some of your high school classes, uh, science classes where you're talking about energy. All right, we have renewable energy and we have non-renewable and en renewable energy. Um, renewable energy is going to be energy that comes from natural naturally occurring resources. So these are things like solar energy, like if you have solar panels attached to your house, or um, wind energy with turbines, or even geothermal, which is heat that they actually extract from the earth via heat pump. And um, a lot of newer buildings, they will use geothermal energy as a way to heat buildings like maybe in the winter time, all right? They use natural energy from the earth. Um, instead of having to put in uh, more mechanical systems that rely on non-renewable energy and um, impact the environment. All right, so non-renewable energy sources, these are things like fossil fuels and um, nuclear, nuclear energy. All right, in terms of building site conditions, um, architects are going to be analyzing various factors of the building site to ensure that their design is optimal. All right, so some examples of the things an architect is going to be looking closely at. They're going to be analyzing sun patterns in the summer and winter to maximize the daylighting within the building. Doing so is going to help them reduce energy costs, you know, of whoever owns the building because it's going to minimize the amount of artificial light that is needed to illuminate the space, okay? 
So um, whenever an architect approaches a project, they're going to be looking at all these different factors in terms of the environment um, in order to make their design as sustainable and as efficient as possible. Okay, the whole goal is to basically use nature to your benefit. Okay, we're going to bring in as much natural daylight as we can and that natural daylight is going to one light up the space and it's going to reduce the amount of artificial light that you're going to need so I don't have to turn on the lights as much throughout the day which will save me on my energy bill um, but it's also going to allow more heat to get into the space and that's going to reduce maybe our heating bills okay in the winter time so there's a lot of facets to their approach to um, you know designing a building from the ground up. Um, they might also um, analyze wind patterns in the winter and summertime. Again, um, you know they might use a passive like cooling system, so that way you could, you know, you can maybe open up a, a window on one side of the building and a window on the other side of the, the uh, building, and get the wind traveling all the way through. Um, maybe in the summertime to cool it, cool down the space, you get natural ventilation that way. And so then you don't need to run your AC as much and that saves on your AC bill. Um, they'll also look at privacy concerns, okay, to make sure that um, the occupants of the building have um, privacy wherever they need it. Um, they'll look at the site to uh, determine where the um, the best views are and figure out the best ways to optimize um, the views from within the building. And then they might also um, analyze the sound conditions of the site. So if you're building in a, you know, like downtown in a city, for instance, and it's very noisy outside, you have street sounds, things like that, they're going to take a look at all that and they're going to determine what the requirements are to bring the sound within the within the building down to a reasonable level okay um, they might also take a look at soil conditions so um, is the site that we're building on is the soil compacted is it is it like uh, rocky material is it swampy you know is there going to be a lot of um, need to modify the earth whenever we go and build a new building, you know, all those things have to be taken in consideration um, because, you know, it's not simple. It's not as simple as you can just pick a plot of land and just throw something up. Um, you have to make sure that the site and the soil is going to support whatever structure you're trying to put onto it. So we have to know what kind of modifications we're going to have to make to the earth in order for it to sustain a structure. Um, and then they're also going to look at the topography of the landscape, okay? So this is the changes in elevation associated with the landscape. Um, all these factors, like I've said, they help an architect determine if a site is suitable and it helps them determine a building's orientation on the site. Interior designers also need to consider these factors and how they impact a building's interior layout. All right, so for example, in the Northern Hemisphere, Spaces requiring more heat and sunlight should be placed on the south or west side of a building. Um, so in this case, if you're in one of the, if you're in the northern hemisphere, you might try to orient living spaces, office and productivity spaces, and social spaces um, on the south or west side of a building. So that way, you're drawing in as much natural heat and sunlight as you can. Um, but then on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, spaces that require less light and less heat should be placed on the north or east side of the building because those sides of the building naturally in the northern hemisphere they don't get as much um, direct sunlight okay so in that case you might orient a bathroom or a storage area or a mechanical or utility space on that side of the building so um, like I said an architect is looking at these site conditions from the perspective of the building as a whole and you are focused on the interior side and you're trying to determine the optimal way to arrange the interior spaces to basically um, capitalize on what the architect is doing or complement is maybe a better word uh, what the architect is doing with the building as a whole 
um, you're an integral part of ensuring that the architect's approach is going to be effective based on where you are putting your spaces. Okay, so if an architect is setting up this building so that they're getting the most heat and sunlight in one area and they know that that is going to be best for like maybe a living space or like a social space, they're going to expect you to plan accordingly and um, work your interior layouts in a way that complements what they are doing. Okay, I hope that makes sense. All right, so that's it for chapter one. It's a pretty short chapter. Chapter two is going to be talking about designing for the environment. So here we're going to be looking a little bit more at building construction. We're going to be kind of talking about that a little bit, introducing some basic terminology when it comes to building um, construction and also touching a little bit more on sustainability, what exactly that means and what exactly goes into ensuring sustainability in a project, okay? So to start off, we're going to start by discussing the building envelope. So the building envelope is basically the interface between the interior of a building and the outside environment, okay? You can think of it as our skin. It protects the interior environment from the exterior environment, okay? So it's basically like the building's skin. Um, the building envelope is going to serve three primary purposes. So it acts as a thermal barrier. It traps in warm or cool air, all right? So if you have like a, um, a thermos or some sort of like a, um, like a Yeti or something like that, something that you put your drinks in that is insulated and it keeps your hot drinks hot. So if you put coffee in it, it's gonna keep your coffee hot. Or if you put an ice drink in it, it's gonna keep your ice from melting. It's very much like that. It needs to provide a thermal barrier to regulate the interior temperature whatever that is. If you're trying to keep it warm or you're trying to keep it cool, the building envelope needs to act as a thermal barrier in order to sustain whatever temperature you're trying to maintain inside. Now, it also acts as a weather barrier. So it's gonna shield the interior from exterior weather conditions. Okay, so like rain and snow, all that type of stuff. And then it also acts as a sound barrier. So it's gonna block any unwanted noises coming in from the outside. The building envelope is made up of three basic components. So first we have the foundation. The foundation is the bottom most part of a building structure. Okay, so the foundation is what anchors the building and transfers building loads to the earth. Okay, the whole goal is taking everything that's above and taking all that weight from all of those structures like the walls and the floors and the roof and everything like that and and transferring that whole load into the earth. Um, next, we have the exterior walls, and these are what support the roof by transferring loads to the building's foundation. So it's gonna take that roof load, it's gonna take all that weight and put it down to the foundation, which again, puts that into the earth. Um, exterior walls control the passage of heat, air, sound, moisture, and water vapor in and out of the building. And rigid exterior walls act as what are known as shear walls. Shear walls transfer lateral wind and seismic, which is earthquake, loads to building the building's foundation. All right, so basically, shear walls are special types of walls that they build, and these are structural walls that are meant to, you know, keep the building intact whenever it faces like maybe an intense wind or you know if there was an earthquake or something like that and all this stuff is going to be going in we're going to get into more detail a bit later on in some of the f later modules this is just bas basically a um, introduction to all these things um, exterior walls can be made of different materials uh, such as brick wood or glazing all right glazing by that i mean like glass so if you think back to like curtain walls that we've done in the past um, you know, it can be a system like that. Um, next is the roof. Okay, so the roof is the primary sheltering component of a building's interior from the elements. All right. The roof also controls thermal radiation, temperature, humidity, and airflow. And it keeps out creatures, it keeps out water, it controls fire. Um, here, if you look at uh, this 
little diagram that we have here, this illustration. This is going to show you the basic components of the building envelope. So you can see we have the foundation, but then we have the exterior walls and then the roof, okay, obviously. And the exterior walls can be like a solid material, or here you can see it's made of a glazing material. Um, roofs, they come in a variety of forms. Okay, so here's a basic illustration of all different types of roofs, and there's even more than this too, but any roof is some sort of a variation off of um, something that you're seeing here. So the main ones that we have are flat roofs, and then we have shed roofs, which is basically a slope in one direction. Um, next, I would say gable roof. This is common. This is basically a, um, a roof that slopes in two directions, but it's evenly split down the center. That's what a lot of our houses are. They are gable roofs, okay? That's very common. Um, gamble roofs, these are common for like sheds and stuff like that. Um, maybe a lot of older, older buildings use these too. Um, but when I think of gamble roofs, I usually think of a structure like you're seeing exactly here, like my neighbor, if I look out the window right now, he has a shed that has this exact type of roof on it. Um, mansard roofs, these are used in a lot of older architecture, but basically it's like a sloping pitch that ends with a flat top here. So it's basically a pyramid um, with just the top cut off of it. Um, then we have hip roofs, okay? So this is where it's sort of like a pyramid, but it doesn't, not all four sides meet at a perfect point. Um, here we have a pyramid hip, which is where all sides do meet at a perfect point in the center. Um, and then these kind, these aren't as common. Um, then we have domes, you know, like if you think of um, classical architecture, they use a lot of domes and like barrel vaults. Um, a barrel vault is just a, like a semi-circle type shape, semi-circular type shape in one direction. A groin vault is a combination of basically two barrel vaults that intersect one another. And then a domed vault is basically a combination of all three. So you take a, a groin vault and then you would basically throw a dome into it and then you get this domed vault that you have here. All right, so next we're gonna talk about heat flow. So heat flows through the building envelope using properties of thermodynamics. Okay, so that's a, that's a, a term you might have heard in like chemistry classes if you've taken um, any in the past or like maybe a physics class. Um, the book goes into more detail on thermodynamics, but just be familiar that um, heat follows the laws of thermodynamics, okay? You don't need to go into as much detail as the, you know, maybe they're showing in the book. Um, basically what thermodynamics is saying is that heat is always gonna flow from an area of high temperature to an area of low temperature, all right? Um, heat tends to rise. I mean, that's what it does naturally. That's also known as the stack effect. And that means that heat is commonly going to be lost through the roof of buildings. Okay. So that's why it's very important. Um, whenever we're insulating a building and we're going to get into this more in a little bit that we insulate that well, because that's going to be one of our primary areas where our heat's going to be lost because the heat naturally just wants to rise up and go through the roof. Okay. So if you trap the heat, in the um, like the attic, if you insulate your roof, you're going to be retaining a lot more heat into the building. Um, next, we have what are known as thermal bridges. And a thermal bridge is basically a component that has a higher thermal conductivity than its surroundings. So thermal conductivity, what I mean by that is something that conducts heat uh, more so than um, something else, so like a material. So if you think about like metal, um, metal is a high conductor of heat, so um, if you have like a pan, like obviously that's going to absorb heat and it's going to transfer that heat really quickly. And if you have a piece of wood and you heat that up, it's going to take a long time for that uh, wood to become warm because it has a lower thermal con conductivity rate. All right, so a thermal bridge is basically an area within a building um, assembly that has a high thermal conductivity, you know, higher than its surroundings. So these promote heat loss by acting as a path of least resistance 
uh, for heat. And some examples include studs, concrete slabs, fastening elements, metal balconies. Here's a little diagram that I threw in here because that's kind of maybe a hard concept to wrap your head around unless you're not seeing it. But basically, if we have an interior environment um, and an exterior environment here, this concrete balcony is going to act as a thermal bridge. So our wall that we have right here, exterior wall, that's basically acting as a, um, a barrier, a thermal barrier. But this concrete has a high um, thermal conductivity, much higher than this wall that we have here. And since it acts as a um, connection point between the interior and the exterior, see it's not broken up anywhere between the interior and the exterior, that allows heat to flow out of the interior through it because we don't have this wall right here blocking it. So the heat can just go and it can just um, enter the concrete and that can flow out and um, vice versa, the cold air can work its way in and it can flow into the interior of the space. So this is, this is our thermal bridge in this case, okay? So it's not insulated. Um, and if we go on, I have a video here that is going to explain this in a little bit more detail and make it a little bit easier for you to understand. All right, so go ahead and watch that video. Um, thermal resistance, this is a measurement that reflects a building material's ability to resist temperature changes. Um, architects increase the thermal resistance of a building by adding insulation or, reflect, or reflective sheets or by creating more air spaces um, within like a building's assembly. Uh, thermal capacity, this is it, the ability of a material to store heat. So buildings are constructed with materials that have high thermal capacities and are better at regu regulating interior temperatures. All right. Um, so when you think of thermal capacity, think of like insulation and stuff. We're trying to put things into the building structure that um, retains heat. So that way we can regulate the inter uh, interior temperature as efficiently and as easily as possible. Um, heat and moisture flow process. So heat is gained or lost in three ways. Um, we have convection, conduction, and radiation. So all that should be a review from some of your um, science classes in the past. Convection um, exchanges heat between a fluid and a solid. Conduction uh, transfers heat directly from molecule to molecule. Radiation transfers heat via electromagnetic waves from hotter surfaces to detached colder ones. Here I have a little diagram how you can see how um, all three of these concepts go into a space. Okay, so you can see we have um, cold air uh, coming in via uh, convection from these windows. The cold air uh, sinks down to the floor level. So if you remember back, hot air wants to rise, cold air wants to um, um, go toward the floor, it wants to go lower. Um, so here we have a fire, the fire is sending out heat in the form of radiation into the interior space. And then um, the convection is continuing up through this chimney. And as it touches this um, heat source here, being the fire, it heats up and you can see that it escapes through the chimney as hot air. Um, and then conduction, basically that's heat that is directly in contact with this cement pad right here and being in direct contact with it, the heat is heating up that pad and it's flowing through and it's heating up the floor right here, all right? Um, next, evapora evaporation, that is a process where a liquid is converted to a gas or a vapor. Evaporation causes latent heat to be lost from wet surfaces. Um, and the following things are what impact a building's uh, building envelopes ability to transmit heat. So surface area, materiality, material thickness, building orientation of the sun, shading, exterior color, um, temperature of a building's surroundings, um, temperature of the building's interior. Um, heat can be gained or lost through the building envelope in three ways. So we have transmission, infiltration, and ventilation. Heat loss can be minimized by compact design, um, the use of common walls between buildings, and the application of insulation. 
All right, next we're gonna start talking a little bit more about like insulation and things like that. Um, but first we need to touch on uh, two things which are known as R fact or U factors and R values. Okay, so U factors, which are also known as U values, are expressions of the steady rate at which heat flows through architectural envelope assemblies. U factor requirements are defined in building code standards. All right, so if you go and look at your local building codes and you look at what they have to say about building um, envelope assemblies, they're going to have specifications in there about the type of U factors the building needs to um, adhere to. Okay. Um, U factors are used by engineers to determine building envelope design criteria. They apply to all elements that are a part of a building's envelope and a lower U factor rating is going to equate to a lower heat flow rate. All right. So, um, the goal is to basically make the U factor rating as low as you can. So that way you're not losing heat very quickly from the interior of the building to the exterior of the building. Um, next we have R values. So R values are measurements of a given material's thermal resistance. So a thermal resistance, that is our resistance to heat flow. Okay. Um, and each material has a specific um, resistance value that is associated with it basically. Um, and R value is basically the reciprocal or the opposite of the U factor. So that means that a higher R value is going to, going to equate to a higher thermal resistance. And that means it takes more time for heat to flow through the material. R value requirements for building envelopes are defined by local building codes. All right. And, um, the requirements may vary based on climate zones. Okay, so that's something that you have to consider whenever you're designing. Well, architects mainly have to consider that. Um, your building codes, depending on where you're located in the country, are going to vary on these insulation requirements because, you know, for example, if you're in a warm climate like Florida, um, that's going to have lower um, insulation or R value and you factor requirements because it doesn't get as cold during the year. All right, so you don't need as much insulation because that structure is always going to stay relatively warm throughout the entire year. Now, in a northern climate, you know, like up here in Ohio, that's going to have a much higher U or R factor um, or R value requirement because we do need that insulation because we get very cold in the winter time and we have to trap in as much heat as we can. So, if you look at building codes up here, they're going to specify that you use insulation with a higher rating so that you can trap in the appropriate amount of heat, basically, based on the location. Um, here's a video that really clearly explains the difference between U factors and R values. So go ahead and watch that. Um, but if you think of R values, you've probably seen this before if you've ever been to like Home Depot or um, Lowe's or if you've done any remodeling work. So um, here's just an example of some bat insulation and on the insulation packaging they usually advertise the R value rating that is tied to that um, particular type of insulation. So here we can see that this is just an R13 and um, this table that we have here is pulled from the textbook but this is going to give you a basic idea of the R values that are um, associated with these different types of materials. And um, R value is basically defined by the thickness of the material. Okay, so um, this this uh, video explains that really well. Um, material flow through the building envelope, or moisture flow, I'm sorry, through the building envelope. Moisture flows through the building envelope assemblies as liquids and as vapors. Okay, so air is humid. That means it contains water vapor. And the water vapor is going to, or the water vapor in the air is going to move from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. That's a process called diffusion. That's very similar to how heat transfer works. It's going to um, move from an area of high heat to an area of low heat. Okay, so anywhere it's colder, the heat's going to want to go uh, to that area. Um, during the summer months, humid air is going to flow into air conditioned spaces. This creates the need for dehumidification, all right? So if you think about, you've been in a classroom or something, 
um, like when I was in high school, we had a really old building and it didn't have a very good AC system or actually I don't think we had AC at all, but it would get really muggy in there and they would have to run like dehumidifiers and stuff. Or if you think about like your basements in the summertime, the air down there gets so um, moist, I guess. There's a lot of vapor in the air. And to dry that out and make the space, you know, not musty and stuff, you're gonna have to run dehumidifiers just because of how it, just how, how um, humid the air gets during the summer months. Um, during the winter months, the air is less humid. That's because um, the air is, the air molecules, you know, in the winter time, they just can't retain uh, moisture as well. Um, so. It may be necessary to add humidity to the air for interior spaces with humidifiers. Um, vapor pressure, that is the pressure of vapor in contact with its liquid or solid, fo solid form. Um, this force drives the flow of moisture through a building envelope assembly. Moisture flows through gaps in a building envelope assemblies uh, through airflow and uh, moisture within a building envelope assembly is destructive and it needs to be avoided. Okay, so if you don't have a proper air barrier on your building uh, envelope, that's going to promote the transmission of moisture into the structure of that envelope um, because airflow is basically what carries the moisture inside. So we need to make sure that we, whenever we design these building envelope assemblies, that we have a proper like moisture and um, um, air barrier so that the, um, the moisture can't make its way into the structure of the assembly. All right, so as you can see here, here's an example where um, the moisture has gotten in and moisture can damage wood elements and promote mold, mold and mildew growth. Here you can see um, we have an interior space and moisture has gotten in behind or maybe on the front side of this drywall and it has caused black mold to grow on the surface of this wall. Okay, so um, it's very destructive and we have to make sure that we create our assemblies in ways that prevent um, things like this from happening. To do that, to prevent these issues, um, we can use special building components called vapor retar uh, retarders. Sometimes they're called vapor barriers. Vapor retarders, vapor barriers, they're similar but they're not necessarily the same thing in, in every case. Um, but basically, they are materials that resist the flow of water vapor through a building envelope assembly. Um, they're thin membranes, so usually they're just thin pieces of plastic film. Um, and we install these within the building's exterior wall assembly on the warm side of the wall. So in a cold climate, the warm side of the wall is going to be the interior side of the wall behind the finished face. Uh, material. So if we have drywall, for example, and we're in a cold climate, like maybe up in Ohio, they might put a moisture barrier or a vapor uh, retarder right behind your drywall. In a warm climate, they would put this on the warm side, which is the exterior side, because that's where all the sunlight's hitting. And that's usually the warmer side of the wall. Um, and that would go uh, behind the exterior sheathing. Vapor retar retarder requirements are defined in local building codes and they're um, determined based on climate zones, okay? So here's a video where you can learn about vapor retarders and how they work. All right, next we have insulation materials. So insulation is added to the building envelope to prevent heat loss in cooler months and heat gain in warmer months. Insulation is commonly added to exterior walls, um, ceilings, windows, and roofs. Um, we have something that's known as a mean radiant temperature. This is a value that measures the way an interior space and its furnishings radiate and emit heat into um, uh, to a human body in a given location. All right, so all the objects of an interior, furniture, all that have this value associated with them for how they emit heat and transfer it to our bodies. Basically, that's what that is saying. Um, 
Insulation will increase MRT values and it will help to lower energy consumption by trapping warmer cool air within a building's interior. Um, here's a little diagram from the book and this is basically showing the most common areas where you would insulate in a house. Um, so as you can see here, we usually put insulation into the, inter the uh, exterior walls. We're going to be adding insulation to attic spaces. So up here, for example, right underneath the roof, you're going to be adding a lot of insulation there typically. Um, and then we might add insulation against the foundation walls um, in the basement. All right, air spaces. So these are sheets of air contained on two sides by drywall, brick, insulation, or other building materials. These are necessary because they will slow down heat transfer through a building envelope. So a building wall assembly might not always have um, a air layer within it, so or an air space. But if you look, so for example, if you look at this section here, um, it, it's defined by building codes if you need an airspace or not. But um, this is a section that shows an airspace in a masonry wall. So if you think of a, a brick building, like a commercial building, usually they will have an airspace integrated into the building structure. So you can see this is the facing brick. So this is the brick that you see from the outside of the building. And then between that, there's this airspace, so it's just an open space. Um, we have insulation here too at the bottom, but there's this open area where there's nothing but just dead air between this CMU, so if you think of like concrete block, um, and the brick, there's just this empty space in here where we have nothing but air. And that air acts as an insulation, um, and it prevents the cold air from the outside from getting into the interior or the warm air from the outside from getting into the interior. So if there's an airspace and there's no like circulation, nothing moving that air inside that space around, it's going to act as a natural insulation. Okay, so that's why it's required by building codes because it naturally prevents transmittance of uh, hot or cold air from the exterior to the interior. Air barriers, so these are building components that block the flow of air through the building envelope. Um, the requirements for these are specified by local building codes. They're installed in con continuous sheets under the exterior finished material. Okay, um, They must be airtight, but they must also allow water vapor to pass through. And they may also act as a vapor barrier in certain situations. Okay, so here you can see if you've ever seen like a house being in, uh, being built, um, they put this house wrap around it. That's an example of like an air barrier. It's going to prevent air from the outside pushing its way to the interior, and that in turn is going to prevent um, like unwanted moisture from making its way through as well through the building envelope. Um, insulation types. So there's a bunch of different types of insulation and each of them have uh, different thermal resistance properties and applications. When choosing an insulation type, um, special thought needs to be given to the materials R value rating and also its moisture resistance, fire resistance, potential for to toxic smoke, um, physical strength and st stability over time. All right, um, common commonly insulation is made of fiberglass, rock wool, cotton, synthetic fibers, and foam. Most insulation types are effective due to small air spaces or little pockets within the material that slows down heat transfer. So again, like we were saying previously with those, um, those air spaces within our walls, insulation materials act in a very similar way because they make use of pockets of air to slow down the um, heat transmission rates. Um, insulation commonly comes in various forms such as bats, loose fill material, and rigid or spray foam. Bat insulation is basically like blankets that are placed into wall cavities. So if you think back a few slides, um, I showed you that picture of the insulation roll, the pink in insulation roll. That is an example of a bat insulation. Okay, so basically it comes in rolls 
and you unroll it and it's basically like a blanket that you're putting into a wall cavity, okay? So you can see here's a little illustration of a guy putting um, a roll of that between two studs in a, in a wall. Um, loose fill insulation consists of fibers that are blown into a, a wall cavity. These are commonly made of cellulose, which is a paper-like material. Um, older loose fill uh, insulation may be made of vermiculite, and this is a toxic material. So they don't make it out of this anymore. But in a lot of like old houses and stuff, if you ever, um, if you ever lived in an old house or if you've been in an old house um, and seen the insulation that they use, they might, if you go in the attic and look, they might have vermiculite and that can be dangerous to like touch and breathe. And usually it has these like sparkly little flecks throughout it. And that's how you can, that's a dead giveaway to tell if it, if it's vermiculite or not. But like I said, they don't use that anymore because it's really dangerous. Um, and you have to like get a specialized team in there to your house if it, like you have to remove it or something. If you don't touch it, I think it's fine. But if you're going to remove, it's sort of like asbestos, like you don't want to mess with it. But um, if you ever have to remove it, they have to bring people in with like special masks and stuff to like remove it all. So it's a big deal. Um, cellulose. That is really common, and that's actually what's in my house. So my house is like, um, my house was built in 1914, so it's over 100 years old. And our walls were retrofitted um, with um, cellulose. So what they do basically is they drilled a bunch of holes into the siding of my house. And then they take like a special here. Um, you can see like they have this hose, and they will put that hose into those holes that they put on the exterior of the house and they will blow these little particles, these little, um, it's like a paper like material, like a, a chopped up cardboard material and they fill the wall cavities with that. Um, so that's the way they retrofit. But then here you can see in a new construction building, they would just bring in these hoses and just like fill like the attic spaces. Uh, with this stuff. So inside like the joists and things like that, they just pack it full of this, uh, this loose fill material. Um, now it can also come as foam insulation. That's like a more modern solution. That's what a lot of things are going to nowadays because foam is a really good insulator. Um, but foam can come in rigid sheets. Um, you'll see these at like home centers a lot. Like they come in like pink or blue, um, just sheets of like foam. Uh, and these are applied to exterior sides of walls or they can be sprayed within wall cavities on the interior. Um, and they can be either an open cell foam or a closed cell foam. Uh, here you can see there's a guy like in an attic and he's spraying foam insulation on the, um, within the rafter space of the roof. And as he sprays this, this is going to expand and um, it's gonna close up any gaps that exist. Um, so it's really good for, for getting in and, and really sealing everything up nice. And then once they have it sprayed, they actually take a special knife and they go and they shave off the face of the foam and they just make a nice flat, smooth face of it. All right, um, here in this diagram, you can see rigid insulation. So that is basically just a sheet that they're gonna be place up against the, um, the structure of the wall. All right. Um, here are a couple of videos. Um, this one explains the different types of insulation. And then this video here is gonna explain insulation and how our values tie into um, in, uh, different types of insulation. All right, now we're gonna talk about energy efficiency and how we incorporate energy efficiency into our designs. So passive systems, these are systems that consume energy but do not produce energy. In architecture, a passive system takes advantage of natural conditions for things such as heating, energy, and lighting. Passive design solutions let nature do the work. It avoids using high-grade resources for low-grade tasks. So for example, um, we can use solar energy to power our buildings. Um, we can use the natural heat that's emitted from the sunlight to heat up the interior of a building. Uh, we can use natural daylighting that's emitted by the sun to light up the building so that we're saving on um, our lighting costs. 
Um, and then we can use natural ventilation so we can harness the wind and use that to cool down um, the interior space of our building. Um, direct gain systems. So these introduce heat directly into a space through ordinary fenestration. So think of like um, windows that are letting sunlight in. These utilize materials that are high in thermal mass to store heat. Um, stored heat is then dissipated when the temperatures fall to um, heat the interior spaces. Common direct gain systems use walls with high thermal masses to collect solar heat and the building orientation is important to ensure that heat is collected efficient, er, efficiently. So in this case, you would have maybe a wall with like the, whatever material it's made up of is going to like be able to store a lot of heat. And you want that wall to be oriented so that um, it gets the maximum amount of sunlight so it can retain as much or it can get as much heat as possible and retain as much heat as possible. Um, and then we have indirect gain systems. These are systems that place thermal mass between the sun and the occupied space. Sunlight will strike the thermal masses where it is then um, absorbed and stored and then slowly transferred into the occupied space. The thermal storage material may be masonry or water, for example, and there are three basic types of thermal storage walls. There are roof ponds. Um, Oh, the three basic types, there are thermal storage walls, there are roof ponds, and there are greenhouses, and there are sun spaces. Trome walls. So a trome wall is a wall that consists of a thermal mass behind a sheet of south-facing glazing. It traps solar heat between the glazing and thermal mass. The trapped heat is gradually permeated through the wall to the heat the interior space at night. All right, so if you look at this, right here is our trome wall. And what you have here is a sheet of glass and then you have a wall behind it with a material that's a it's got a high thermal capacity so it can store a lot of heat so the building this is the south side okay this is facing south and during the summer um well actually during the winter whenever you need to heat up the interior space the sunlight's going to strike that glazing and that basically is like acting as a magnifying glass, okay? And it's heating up this air that's behind it. Okay, so you can see we have an air space between the glass and the wall. That air is gonna get really hot, and then slowly as we get toward the nighttime, that air is gonna permeate through this wall structure, and it's going to um, radiate and store, or it's gonna heat up this interior space, okay? So that's just a natural way of heating up the interior without having to rely on um, like a heating system, okay? Like a furnace and stuff. All right, next we're gonna talk about some sustainable design practices. So sus sustainability, um, green design. Green is kind of like our buzzword that we use nowadays. So we wanna design things uh, green, green energy. Sustainability is a major concern in modern design. Sustainable design seeks to reduce negative impacts of buildings on the environment. Um, its, its official definition is a holistic approach to building design that reduces negative social, economic, and ecological impacts of the environment through con um, conservation and reuse of natural resources like energy, water, and materials. There are many facets to a truly sustainable design solution. Each discipline, so engineers, architects, interior designers, we all play a unique role in contributing to a sustainable design, right? So everybody who's on a project team is going to have a different focus and a different responsibility um, in order to make the entire building design sustainable. Architects and engineers, they're going to focus on energy efficiency, green energy, and selection of environmental, environmentally friendly building materials. Interior designers, on the other hand, and this kind of goes back to what I mentioned in the first chapter, we're going to focus on selecting environmentally friendly materials for interior use. Um, we may also specify energy and resource efficient fixtures, think lighting, plumbing, etc. The main goal of sustainability is no net environmental impacts. Um, 
This involves avoiding the use of non-renewable resources. So we're always going to be looking toward renewable resources for our design solution, okay? Well, as much as we can, um, that's the main goal. Um, three values are used to guide sustainable design. Waste equals food. Produce, uh, produce everything so that when it's useful, life is over. It becomes a healthy source of raw materials to produce new things. Respect diversity. Divi or design everything to respect the region, culture, and materials of a place. Use solar energy. Buildings must be designed to be responsive to this non-polluting and renewable energy source. Energy and materials. Most mechanical and electrical systems rely on non-renewable non energy. One non-renewable energy or once non-renewable energy resources are exhausted, they cannot be replaced. All right. Renewable energy res resources are dependent on nature and they're available indefinitely. So we can always go back to these renewable resources and get more of them because they're not going to go away. All right. Embodied energy. This is a sum of all energy required to produce a building material. So if you look at this chart that I have here, this basically is going to walk you through the energy cycle of a material. Okay, so we have what's known as the embodied energy, and this is like every, all the energy that was exerted to make that material. So, um, for example, we um, extract the raw materials. That's going to require like excavators and um, fuel to fuel those um, that machinery to ex to extract the material from the earth. Then we have to use fuel to. Tr um, to fuel the vehicles that transport that material to the manufacturer. The manufacturer is going to use fuel to power their machines to process that building material. Then again, we have to use fuel to transmit or transport that um, material to the site. And then we're going to exert energy building that material into the final um, product. Okay. And then um, when that um, material comes to the end of its life, it's going to be recycled and the um, cycle is going to start all over again. All right, so, oops. To conserve energy and materials and limit pollution, it's wise to reduce materials used for building construction and to utilize materials efficiency, efficiently. Existing materials should be salvaged and reused whenever possible. All right, so instead of just going and getting something brand new, you always want to be looking into ways you can take something that is existing and reuse it. So if you've ever been to an architectural salvage place, they will go into these old buildings and they will harvest materials from it. So like old flooring and stuff. Um, those can be used in new, new projects. And um, one, they save the environment. So um, you're not... You're not adding to the carbon footprint by um, using brand new things that are using up a lot of energy, right? You're reusing something that's already there and you're giving it a new life. And also that can be used to your benefit. You know, old materials have a lot of character to them and that can be used um, in a way that um, is beneficial to your design. So maybe your aesthetic or whatever you're going for for your project. Um, you want to select materials that are going to minimize the destruction of the global environment. Here are some, it's just a table showing um, different sustainable design strategies. So you can go ahead and read through all of these, but these are different categories and the ways that you can um, build sustainability into these different aspects of um, you know, the building systems. Um, lastly, this is our last topic. We're going to talk about LEAD. So LEAD is a system, and this stands for Leadership in Energy Environmental Design. So it is an inter industry standard green building certification system. All right. The system provides a set of sustainable design guidelines which architects and interior designers adhere to. Um, buildings designed following LEED guidelines are eligible for LEED certification. All right, so basically what this means is there's a system out there called LEED, and when you're working as a professional designer, 
and you're aiming for sustainability, you can follow a set of guidelines that the lead system provides. And um, as you follow these guidelines, you're gonna be earning points. Okay, so they have this point system and there are different certification levels tied to this point system. Um, so based on your projects, you might pursue a particular certification level um, in terms of sustainability. So there are four different levels of lead certification. There is a certified level, which is the lowest. Then there is a silver level, a gold level, and a platinum level, which is the highest. And these are basically signifying different achievements of your of your project. Okay, so um, it's going to say this building meets like a certain threshold of sustainability, um, and you can be recognized for it. So, for example, here's a picture of a lead platinum plaque. So they take these plaques and they will put these onto the buildings that meet different um, certification levels. So actually the CAED building, the building you guys are in, that is a lead platinum building and I believe they have a plaque that looks like this somewhere near the entryway. It's been a while since I've been there, but I think somewhere you, when you um, walk in the building, you'll see this plaque and that is basically signifying that the design team, whenever they design that building, they were able to achieve the highest level of sustainability within that building design, okay? All right, so like I said, um, the CAED, CAED building has a LEED Platinum certification. Um, and it's the highest rated lead building on the Kent campus. Here's an article about that if you want to read about it. Um, and then there are also a bunch of other lead certified buildings on the Kent campus, and you can read about those too. Um, so as a design professional, you can earn a lead professional accreditation. This is basically um, a certification that you can get that is going to go on your person or your uh, professional record and um, Getting them, it's really popular in, um, in the uh, design industry. So a lot of interior designers and architects, they're gonna have a LEED certification. So it's a very common uh, certification to go for um, whenever you're uh, working as a professional. Um, and the accreditation, that's gonna signify a particular level of knowledge about sustainable design practices. Um, so the reason you would wanna get that is so whenever you're going for a job, you can show that to your employer just a credential that you have and it tells them, yes, I am familiar with sustainability and sustainable design practices at this level. Okay, and there's two different levels of um, professional accreditation. So you can become a lead green associate and then after you have that, you can become a lead accredited professional. All right, so that's gonna do it for um, this week's little lecture. I wanted to keep this short, but it looks like we actually did run a little bit over an hour. Hopefully the um, the later videos that I put out will be a little bit shorter than this, but this was a very content heavy first couple of chapters because there's a lot of topics that we have to get through. So um, that's going to do it for this video.